this is going to be my first A-level revision video and it is going to be law because law is just my favourite subject and more importantly we have a mock on statutory interpretation on Monday and I cannot fail it. I cannot get anything mm. below an A. Oh okay, I can get something below an A, like a B would be okay but no, I must do well so I'm going to make revision videos. Um, I want to keep them under 20 minutes, so I'm probably not going to go through the whole of statutory interpretation right now. That and we haven't done the whole of statutory interpretation yet, so I'm going to break it up. Um, in this video, I'm going to try and go through the literal rule, the golden rule, the mischief rule, and the purpose of approach, and cases applying to that. Um, so... A background to statutory interpretation. Parliament makes legislation which are statutes and judges apply and interpret legislation when a dispute is before them at court. Um, applying and interpreting state statutes isn't always that simple because draftsmen make mistakes. Sometimes the law can be quite vague. Um, sometimes it's quite hard to figure out what Parliament intended by like a law. So Statutory interpretation. Sometimes the meaning of sections in an act or statute can be unclear and ambiguous. And obviously ambiguous means more than one meaning. If you did GCSE English, you should know that. 75% of the cases which reach the Supreme Court are concerned with statutory interpretation. When interpreting statutes, judges, judges are guided by certain rules that have been developed by judges for over hundreds of years. Um, so, the literal rule. Well... It should be, and it usually is, the starting point for judges when applying when applying statute. And when following the literal rule, the words of the statute are given their ordinary literal or dictionary meaning, even if this results in an absurdity. Uh, the judge interprets them as if they are in the dictionary and doesn't look to make sense of them. So an example of this would be in Railway and Berryman um, in 1946, when a railway worker was killed whilst hauling the track. And his widow applied for compensation. Uh, the court held that because the statute only provided compensation for those workers relaying or repairing the track, the widow wasn't eligible. Under the literal rule, oiling, oiling did not fall under the categories of relaying and repairing. And there's also R and Harris, which was in 1836. Uh, the defendant bit off a victim's nose and... The statute stated it was an offence to stab, cut or wound. The court applied the literal rule and held that the act of biting did not come under the meaning of stab, cut or wound. And these words implied the use of a weapon and the weapon wasn't used and the defendant was acquitted, which means found not guilty, which, yeah, it's kind of silly, like stab, cut or wound. But biting off someone's nose is okay. <laughs> Uh, there's also Whiteley and Chapel in 1868. A statute made it an offence to impersonate any person entitled to vote, and the defendant used the vote of a dead man. Um, the statute relating to voting rights required a person to be living in order to be entitled to vote, so the court held that no offence had been committed because when any person entitled to vote, to vote is interpreted literally, it does not include dead people. Actually, because dead people can't vote anyway, so... Why would they be like entitled if they can't vote? Um, there's also Fisher and Bell in 1961. The defendant was a shopkeeper who displayed a knife in a shop window and at the time the Restriction of Offensive Weapons Act 1959 made it an offence to sell this type of knife. The defendant succeeded in persuading the ought that the display in a shop window was not an offer for sale. Under contract law it's an invitation to treat and the defendant was successful in defending the claim against him. This case however with one other helped amend the law on this. Um, so advantages of literal rule. There's the doctrine of the separation of powers. Basically it like kind of respects parliamentary supremacy and respects that there's like a separate that, that there's like separate parts in law making and law enforcement and like justice and stuff and that's the executive the legislator and the 
judiciary. The executives with government, the legislators, parliament, and the judiciary is obviously judges. Judges. Um, this means that they should not interfere with each other. It's easy for the public to follow. Like if you're following the literal rule and you're like, oh well this means this it's the literal rip meaning so public understand it although the answer may not always be right or just it highlights problems that may be within a particular law which means parliament can amend it <coughs> disadvantages of the literal rule um there's the law commission people which don't really like it as it comes up with absurd outcomes um that's another disadvantage the absurd outcomes the and they're not always just or right it doesn't always give effect to parliament's intentions and there can be more than one interpretation to words like to a word because quite often words do have more than one meaning so it can be difficult to find what to use for the you know you know what I mean <laughs> for like to base the decision off and the gold so the golden rule is an extension of the literal rule and the court can look at the literal meaning of the word but if they think it would lead to an absurd result that was not intended by parliament they don't have to use it uh, two approaches are taken while using this and they are the narrow approach and the broad approach the narrow approach is when there's more than one literal meaning to a word and the judge chooses to apply the meaning that leads to the least absurd result. An example of this would be Alan. Um, the defendant married for the second time and was charged under the Offences Against the Person Act 1861, which states that it's an offence to marry again without the previous marriage being ended by divorce. Um, his defence was that it was not possible to legally marry twice and therefore the offence was impossible to commit. The court had to decide whether marry means to become legally married to another person or whether it means to go through the marriage ceremony. To avoid an absurd decision, the court adopted the second meaning, which was to go through the marriage ceremony and found the defendant guilty. The broad approach is that when there's only one literal meaning, but applying this would lead to an absurdity, and the judge can choose to modify the meaning of the word to avoid the absurdity. So an example of this is Adler and George in... 1964 the defendant was charged under the official secrets act in 1920 with obstructing a member of the armed forces in the vicinity of a prohibited place and the defendant argued he was in the prohibited place not in the vicinity of it the court interpreted in the vicinity of to include in a prohibited place to avoid the absurdity of finding the defendant not guilty um so advantages of the golden rule is that it avoids unjust outcomes. Um, for example, Reese Worth, uh, 1935, which was when, according to the Administration of the States Act, 1925, the issue should take a person's, you know, should inherit, inherit from someone once they're dead, once, like, if there's no will left. Um, but in this case, she only had one son and the son killed her um by applying the golden rule he then couldn't inherit because that would be an absurdity and parliament didn't intend for a murderer to inherit like they obviously didn't intend that um also there's like a less absurd outcome if the golden rule was applied to railway and ferryman then the outcome would have been different and made a lot more sense it's the golden rule stops the defendant from avoiding punishment and it also helps to remedy drafting errors disadvantages are that there's no definition or guidance in what absurd means so a different judge may decide one thing's absurd but like another one may decide that's not absurd judges have too much power obviously there's parliamentary supremacy which judges having too much power goes against and it's also undemocratic and Michael Zander described this as the feeble parachute is sort of a way for judges to escape from the limitations of the law okay
so that is all for that. Now I need to find a bit of a sheet. Um, the next rule is the mischief rule. Under this rule, the court will look at the gap in the law which Parliament was attending to address by introducing the statute in the first place. Where legislation has been passed to remedy a weakness or defect in the law, the court should adopt the interpretation that will correct this weakness or mischief. In Hayden's case, it tells us the court should consider four things when attempting to interpret a statutory provision. Um, what was the law before the statute was passed? What was the problem for or mischief the sta statute was trying to remedy? What remedy does the statute attempt to provide and what is the true reason for the remedy? An example of where the mischief rule was applied was in Smith and Hughes in 1960. The defendant was charged under the Street Offences Act 1959 with an offence to solicit in the street or a public place. Uh, the defendant was a prostitute who solicited men from a balcony and through a window while in her home. She was found guilty of the offence even though she wasn't in the street. In making this decision, the court stated that Parliament's intention was to clean up streets and the statute was aimed at preventing people from being solicited whilst in the street or a public place. Um, advantages of the mischief rule are that it follows Parliament's wishes. It respects the doctrine of parliamentary supremacy. Uh, the Law Commission call it a rather more satisfactory approach and it promotes flexibility and avoids unjust and absurd results. Disadvantages are that it means judges can make new laws, for example in the Royal College of Nursing of the UK and DHSS in 1981 where the Abortion Act was in question and it stated registered medical only registered med medical practitioners could take part in abortions. Um, this case kind of decided that nurses were also classed as registered medical practitioners. Um, it's also argued that it's outdated. Obviously Hayden's case was in the 16th century. Um, it was in 1584, which is a really long time ago. And lots of things have changed since then. Lots of things in the world, lots of things in the law. It's not always easy to discover what the mischief was. So the final approach I'm going to take you through today is the purpose of approach, which is the modern version of the mischief rule. Judges must look at what Parliament intended when passing the new law. Judges will look at the common law position before the act was passed. This approach is used to interpret European Union laws and human rights laws, and it's been become more popular since the UK joined the EU in 1973. An example of this is Pepper and Hart in 1993. The purpose of approach was used here to interpret Section 63 of the Finance Act 1976. The court looked at Hansard, which are statements made in the House of Commons. Um, this was while they were debating the Finance Bill in order to decide what Parliament intended when passing the Act. There was also Jones and Tower Boot Co. in 1997, where the Court of Appeal looked at whether the physical and verbal abuse of a young black worker by his workmates fell within the course of employment in the Race Relations Act. The purpose of approach was used by looking at the Parliament's intention, which was to eliminate discrimination in the workplace, and it was found that his abuse was found within the course of employment because of the purpose of approach. Advantages are similar to the mischief rule. Um, also, this approach is used in other EU countries and therefore it promotes consistency throughout the EU and it brings us more in line with our EU counterparts and some circumstances are more likely to give effect to Parliament's intention than the literal approach. Um, an example of how it avoided an absurd result was in Coltman and Bibby Tankers in 1987, the court had to interpret the meaning of the word equipment in the Employers' Liability Act 1969. The employee was killed when a ship provided the employ by the employer sank. Um, the question was, was the ship equipment? Equipment was defined in the Act as any plant machinery, vehicle, aircraft and clothing. The House of Lords applied the purpose of approach, stating that the ship was equipment. If a more literal approach had been used, the employer wouldn't have been liable. Disadvantages uh, it gives too much power to the unelected judiciary and this makes it undemocratic. And in some situations, ju judges can overstep their role by making decisions based on public policy. Um, for example, in Fitzpatrick and Sterling Housing Association, LDD, the court interpreted the word family in the Rent Act 1977 
to include homosexual relationships. Um, the disagreeing judges stated that recognition of homosexual relationships was a matter of public policy and should be for parliament to decide and not judges. I will go through the language rules of statutory interpretation and the rest of it which we haven't done yet in my next video and I will see you then. Bye!